بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله اللهم صل على محمد بدر علي اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد so in the last session, we discussed the life of Imam Ali al-Hadi alayhi salam. And in this course, we're covering the history and the development of the Shi'i school of thought. Because as we know, the Shi'i school of thought has developed to where it is today. It didn't begin in the way it is right now. As the Imams taught people, as people had to adapt to the circumstances of their time, new ways of life, new methodologies emerged. For example, during the time of the Imam, people had access to the Imams. They would go to the Imam, Yabna Rasulullah, and they would ask them a fiqhi question, and then the Imam would answer. Now you have a development of a new methodology of seeking knowledge from the Imam, and that is through the wakala, through Nuwab. And this began during the time of Imam al-Jawad. Also, it began during the time of Imam Sadiq, of course, and, and before Imam Sadiq. However, during the time of Imam al-Jawad, Imam al-Hadi, Imam al-Askari, it became very apparent, it became very clear. So we finished Imam al-Hadi, and of course we discussed that Imam al-Hadi was summoned to Samarra, and he was living in a military base. This is why they called both of them, they're known as Al-Askariyain, Imam Al-Hadi and Imam al Imam al Hassan Al-Askari who we're going to be covering today. Al-Askar is a garrison town, a, a town of an army. Naam? Military. military encampment. So the part of Samarra that Imam Al-Hadi and Imam Al-Hassan Al-Askari were living in was actually the base of the, the military of that government. So the Khalifa he wanted the Imams to be living under the watch of the soldiers and the army just because he was afraid that the Imam was going to, you know, his popularity is going to attract people to him and he felt threatened by the, or all of the Khulafa, not just one, they felt threatened by the popularity of the Imams. So today inshallah we will talk about the life of Imam al-Hassan al-Askari a very important time because this leads us to Imam al-Mahdi and the life and the circumstances of Imam al-Askari he prepared the Shia although his fathers as well did like Imam al-Hadi, Imam al-Jawad and the other Imams but his he was the one who had the direct impact on preparing the Shia for the Ghaibah and preparing the Shia to accept that al-Mahdi has been born. One of his main duties was to show the khawas, the closer Shi'as, that he has a son. And they even say, inshallah, in, in the next session, in the future sessions, we're going to talk specifically about Imam al-Mahdi, maybe more than one session, because that's a big topic. But Imam al-Hassan al-Askari, on the birth of Imam al-Mahdi, he made a walima. And now, today you could go out in public and you say, I had a son. The Imam, he has to announce that he has a son, but he has to preserve the life of his son. So this is why even in our hadith, saying the name of the imam is something that, you know, it's something that the, the imams would tell them, don't even say his name. Ta call him by his title, Al-Mahdi. Al al don't even say his first name, which is the same name as his grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So there was that much taqiyya surrounding the imam. But Imam al-Hassan al-Askari, that was one of his duties. But today, many of us, we don't know much about Imam al-Askari. You ask some of the Shi'as about Imam Ali, Imam al Hussein, Imam al-Sadiq, they'll know a few things. Ask them about the later Imams, not many of us know. We don't know about the details, we don't know about the life of the Imam. And we need to learn, as followers of the Ahlul Bayt, we need to learn because we believe in the 12 Imams. And since we accept them as our Imams, all of them, we have to be familiar with their names, with at least several hadith from each imam. No one hadith, one story, one, one thing about the life of the imam. 
not just, you know, Hussein, Hussein, and we beat our chest and we don't know anything about Imam al-Askari and Imam al-Hadi and Imam al-Rada and, and these other Imams. So we need to know, and the circumstances of the later Imams, they brought us to where we are right now. Ijtihad, um, follow, taqlid, following a marja, following a scholar. There's a, there's a special hadith from Imam al-Askari, which, which we will mention. So we will appreciate the Imam more if we know about their lives and we will appreciate our scholars more because some of the scholars, they were connected with the Imams. Like especially during the time of Imam al-Askari, the father of Shaykh al-Saduq, Ali ibn Babawai al-Qummi, was connected with Imam al-Askari. Imam al-Askari right now, if you go to Qom, there is a, there is a, um, a masjid across from the mausoleum of Sayyidah Ma'suma. Have you been to Qom before? That masjid, it's a big masjid, inshallah, if you go to Qom, it's called Masjid Imam al-Hasan al-Askari. According to some of our scholars, this masjid, the Imam, he ordered his Shia, there was, there was the heads of the Shia that were in Qom, Qom was a historic Shia city even during the time of Imam al-Jawad, Imam al-Hadi, Imam al-Askari. So the Shias were there, the Imam, he ordered for that masjid to be built. So the, that shows us that the Imam was not just, you know, I'm your Imam, I'm going to tell you this is halal and this is haram. No, he was taking care of the affairs of the Shia and there are some stories from the life of the Imam which we will cover inshallah. Any questions before we begin? Okay, so Imam al-Hassan al-Askari was born in year 232 in Medina, 232 after Hijrah. He passed away year 260. Imam al-Mahdi was born year 255. So this is something we have to keep in mind. Now the, bir the births of all the Imams is probably hard to remember. But the birth of Imam al-Mahdi, let's, let, let's keep that you know, ingrained in our mind, 255. And, Imam al and his father, Imam al-Askari, died five years later, 260. So if he lived from 232 to 260, how old does that make him? 28 years. Imam al-Hassan al-Askari, his life was 28 years. He's one of the younger Imams. And we mentioned in the last session, that the Khulafa, they were not even waiting. They're not going to wait for the Imam to be 50 and 60. That's it. They, were, they, they weren't patient with the Imams. So he migrated with his father, Imam al Hassan al Askari. Imam al Askari was two years old when Imam al Hadi migrated because Imam al Hadi spent 20 years in, in Samarra. So he was in year 234, he migrated under the reign of Al Mutawakkil al Abbasi. And the imamah of Imam al-Hassan al-Askari lasted for only six years because his father passed away year 254. The next year, 255, Imam al-Mahdi was born. So the Imam al-Mahdi was born into the imamah of Imam al-Hassan al-Askari. He, he was the imam during that time. We don't have that with all the imams. Some of the imams, like their son, was born during the imamah of their father. Like Imam, imam al-Baqir was born during the imamah of Imam al Hussein. Imam Zain al Abidin was born during the Imam of Amir al Mu'mineen. So, Imam al, -Imam al Hassan al Askari, um, Imam al Mahdi was born into, into, while Imam al Askari was an Imam. He didn't meet his father, his grandfather, Imam al Hadi. So, Imam al Hadi uh, passed away in year 254. So, the Imam of Imam al Askari was from 254 to 260. And he was martyred at the young age of 28. Now, Imam al-Askari, he has many contributions. Today there is tafsir of Imam al-Hassan al-Askari. It's, well, it's, uh, it falls into the category of the rawai, the narrative tafsirs. We mentioned there are some different types of tafsirs. This falls under the category of the tafsir al-Hadith, bil-Hadith. He had a huge impact on the Shia of his time. And one of the greatest impacts is that he's the father of Imam al-Mahdi. He's the father of Imam al-Mahdi and he prepared the Shia for the acceptance of an Imam who's going to be in Ghayba, who they're not going to be connected with. And in fact, the, one of the first of the deputies of Imam, uh, Uthman ibn Sa'id, he was actually the deputy of Imam al-Askari as well. So the first, Imam al-Mahdi has four deputies, inshallah we're going to go into that. The first is Uthman ibn Sa'id. This man, Uthman ibn Sa'id, he was the wakil, he was the deputy of Imam al-Hassan al-Askari. And then into the death of Imam al-Askari, he carried on his duty under Imam al-Mahdi. 
Ajal Allah Ta'ala Farajah Sharif. Yes, brother. Uh, there's a, another name, like a father and a son too. Yes. So was that also located in on the No, because one of them would die after the death of Uthman ibn Sa'id, then then there was another one. Uh Al Hussein ibn Ruh and Yes, then Muhammad bin Uthman, then Hussein bin Ruh, and then what's the... Yes, I'll, I'll look it up right now, I don't have the name memorized. But uh, uh, Uthman, he, wa he was older, because the Ghaybah the the, the Ghaybah Sughra lasted for about 70 years, 69 years. So, so one would pass away, then the Imam, he would give him a letter, and he would tell him, now you are the, the next person, this person is the deputy after me, go to him. So the Shias, they would go to that person. You got the name? Yes. So the father of, the father of Imam al-Askari is Imam al-Hadi. His grandfather is Imam al-Jawad, the son of Imam al-Radha, the son of Imam al-Kadham, al-Sadiq, al-Baqir, al-Sajjad, al-Husayn, Amir al-Mu'mineen, and Rasulullah. His mother, her name is Sosan the mother of Imam al-Askari and the wife of Imam al-Hadi. Sosan, or another name is Salil. And she was known to be a great lady of her time. And all the mothers of, we believe that the mothers of our Imams, all of them were pure. They were carried by, the, you got the name? Ali ibn Muhammad. Ali ibn Muhammad, okay. That was the last one. So, so we believe that the names of, uh, excuse me, that the uh, mothers of the Imams, some of them, they were, some of them, they were freed women, others, they were purchased as slaves, because there were many slaves being brought into the Muslim land at that time, but then they would be freed as soon as the Imam marries them, and once they give birth to a free child, what the slave is referred to as Um Walad. Um Walad, what does it mean? It means that she has a, she's the mother of a free child. In the Islamic law, as soon as a slave would give birth to a free child, meaning that the father was free, now as soon as the father passes away, what happens? She becomes free. The, the, the lady, she becomes free as soon as her, her husband or the one who she was married to passes away. Why is that? Because... Her, the son cannot inherit his mother. So because he cannot inherit his mother, right away she becomes free. So this is why it was considered to be Um Walad. Now we believe that some of the wives, or most of them, that the Imams, they would free them of course. The Imams, after they would marry them, they would consummate the marriage, they would be freed. And there's an there's a issue of dispute regarding the mother of Imam al-Mahdi, Narjas. Um, some scholars like Shaykh al-Saduq and Shahid al-Thani, they say that Narjis, she was freed before Imam al-Askari married her. He married her as a freed lady. Others, they say, no, she was a slave, but then she eventually, she became freed. But this, was, this was the custom of the time. The Imams, some people today, they come and they say, how did the Imams, why did the Imams participate in slavery? The Imams, if they would buy a slave, they would treat the slave as a free person and they would, they would um, educate them, they would give them the best life and then they would free them. Like when we talk about Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam, he would purchase hundreds of slaves, at the end of, he would teach them, they would educate them, at the end of the year he would free them all in the way of Allah and they would be freed as scholars, as great people. The Imams, they did not find any lady who was well enough and, and honorful enough to be carrying the, the next Imam other than these, some of these ladies who were taken as slaves, but then the Imams, they would free them. So we believe that the mothers of the Imams, they were great ladies. This, the mother of Imam al-Askari, Imam al-Askari in year 259 after Hijrah, he passed away, he was poisoned year 260. Year 259, Imam al-Hasan al-Askari, he tells his mother to go to Hajj. He tells her to go to Medina and Mecca. Why is he doing that? Some scholars, they say that the reason he did that is because immediately after the death of Imam al-Askari, the mother of Imam al-Askari, Salil or Sosan, she takes Imam al-Mahdi, the five-year-old child, and where does she go? 
to Mecca. She leaves from the she leaves from the Ghaybat al sughra from the Sirdab. There's a there's a basement there that the Imam was in, and that basement it had another door. It had another door that takes them to the Dijla, to the to the river, to the Tigris River. So they say that it was the the possi- the great you know the possibility is that the Imam because the guards they came into the basement they didn't find the Imam there there was another a- a- exit from the other way he left with the mother of Imam al-Askari and she took him to his to Bani Hashim over there she took him to Medina and but the year before that Imam al-Askari he had sent his mother so that she is well you know, so that she knows the area. She's she's already been there before. So this was some this was one way to prepare to prepare her to protect the life of Imam Al Mahdi, Ajalallahu Ta'ala Faraj Sharif. Of course, the complexion of Imam Al Hassan Al Askari, they say he had a darker complexion. Not too dark, where he was black, but he he was like the typical, you know, those who are in the in the Hijaz area. Because and perhaps maybe a little bit darker because Imam al-Jawad and the, some of the Imams, they had darker skinned mothers. And they were as well darker skinned. So, but then he had a beautiful face, he had high status, he was very respectful. And his title is, uh, one of his titles is Al-Hadi as well, just like his father, and Al-Askari. Al-Askari is one title that he became known with. Imam al-Askari, according to, according to the majority opinion, is that he had one son. Now, there are some opinions which he has, he has others, but the strongest opinion is that he has one son. And his imamah lasted for six years. There are many um, hadith from Imam al-Hadi that he instated Imam al-Hassan al-Askari. One of the narrators, uh, he sa- um, his name is Ali ibn Amr and Nawfali. He says, Kuntu, Kuntu ma'a Abu al-Hassan. I was with Abu al-Hassan. Who is that? Imam al-Hadi, Abu al-Hassan. In his house, in the, in, the court, in the courtyard of his house, in the middle of the house. So, فَمَرَّ بِنَا Muhammad, Muhammad ibn Muhammad, the son of Imam al-Hadi. Have you heard of him? He is buried in Balad, which is close to Samarra. It's about... An hour from Samara, on our way, when we, when we usually when we go to visit Imam al-Askari, if coming from Najaf or Karbala or Baghdad, you pass by a town by the name of Balad. There, Sayyid Muhammad is buried. They, in Iraq, they call him Sab'a al-Dijal, the lion of the Dijal area. The, the area, Dijla, meaning the river, meaning they, they respect him. And, they, and he was known... People, some people, they thought he was the Imam because of how pious and how great he was. So he's the son of Imam, al, the brother of Imam al Askari. Yes, brother. Is he the Sayyid who people say that if you have fertility, issues, yes, you go to him? yes, you go to his shrine and you see cradles, you see a bunch of small cradles in his shrine. And I went and I saw that it's a lot of people that they have fertility issues; they they can't, you know, have children. What they do is they say, they say he's mujarrab. You know, they go and they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his position. And he was a great scholar. He's the son of an imam. He's the brother of an imam. And he was known to be a great scholar. So Sayyid Muhammad, um, they say that a lot of people, they've, they're they able to you know conceive a child as a result of his shafa'ah and his intercession. And I went and I saw there were so many cradles there and next to his shrine. Yes. So the narrator, he sees Muhammad, the son of Imam al-Hadi. He tells him, is he the one after you? Is he the one who's going to be the Imam after you? He says, جُعِلْتُ فِدَاك هَذَا صَحِبُنَا بَعْدَك is he, is he the one who's our Sahib after you? فَقَالَ لَا He says, لَا صَاحِبُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ الْحَسَن He says, no, your leader after me is Al-Hasan. Now, he, Sayyid Muhammad was great, but Imam al-Hassan al-Askari was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of the Shi'as, the majority of the Shi'as, they accepted his imamah. He has another brother, a third brother. Who is he? Ja'far al-Kadhab. And he is the one who Imam al-Mahdi, he, removed, he pushed him aside and he led the prayer. Because Ja'far, he wanted the position of the, uh, of the leadership. And... 
Remember when we were talking about Imam Sadiq alayhi salam? We mentioned the hadith from Imam Zayn al Abdin alayhi salam. And he says that from my children, where Rasulullah said this hadith, he says, From my children, there is Al Ja'far, a Sadiq, and then there is a Ja'far, Al Kadhab. So Imam Ja'far al Sadiq is Ja'far al Sadiq, the truthful one. And then the Imam, he begins to cry. And he says, And there is also one who is Ja'far al Kadhab. Yes, this was in a hadith transmitted to, now it's from Rasulullah, I believe, but it's transmitted through Imam Zayn al Abdin alayhi salam. So this was the, the way of, so the hadith was saying that Rasulullah is talking about Imam Sadiq and he gave him that title, Ja'far al-Sadiq. This, this is what we were talking about. The title Sadiq is given by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So they, the, most, the majority of the Shias, they accepted his imamah and believed in him. Now, um, depending on the ruler, the Imam alayhi salam, he lived during the time of three khulafa. The Khalifa that, that, uh, that took the life of his father, Imam al-Hadi, and um, two others, and the last one who took the life of Imam al-Hasan al-Askari alayhi salam. So, um, I had their names. Anyways, I'm, I'm going to see their names soon. Yes, oh, so he, he lived through three, three khulafa, al-Mu'taz al-Abbasi, who ruled from 252 to 255, Al-Muhtadi, Al-Muhtadi who ruled from 255 to 256, just one year, and Al-Mu'tamid Al-Abbasi who ruled the long, longer, 256 to 279. So the, the, the death of Imam Al-Askari was, was by Al-Mu'tamid Al-Abbasi, and he imprisoned the Imam for a brief time. So the Imams, they were, they were depending on the mood of the Khalifa, Sometimes he would respect the Imam and sometimes he would take them and he would be very nervous from the Imams. But the Imam alayhi salam, he carried out his duties and he did what he had to do by preserving the Tashayyah and preserving the Shia during that time. So Imam al-Askari was imprisoned for a brief while under al-Mu'tamid al-Abbasi who was the last one who eventually you know, poisoned Imam al-Hasan al-Askari alayhi salam. Imam al-Askari, apparently in front of people, they, the government, they made it seem like he was free. But in reality, they were watching him and there were many spies surrounding the house of Imam al-Askari because they knew that al-Mahdi is going to be born soon. This is why Imam al the, the birth of Imam al-Mahdi and the pregnancy was hidden. So the Shias did not even have the freedom to interact with Imam al-Hasan al-Askari. He sends a letter. First of all, the Khalifa, what he would do is he would force the Imam to come to his palace every Monday and Thursday. Every Monday and Thursday, you have to come to the palace. Publicly, in front of people, it was a sign of, oh, we're respecting him, we're bringing him, we're honoring him. But in reality, it was a way to monitor the Imam. And it reached a position where it was so difficult for the Shia, where Imam al Askari, because the Shias, what they would do is, the Imam is in the Askar, they can't reach him in his house. If they reach him, then they're going to be arrested. So they would wait for the Imam when he's going and coming back. On his way to the palace, on his way out, they would be waiting for the Imam so that they could see the Imam. So the Imam, he writes them a letter, he tells them, when you see me walking by, don't say salam to me. And don't point at me. And don't signal to me because I can't trust that your lives are going to be protected or my life is going to be protected if you do that. Imagine the level of taqiyya. Where the Imam says, tell, tell the Shia, don't even say salam to me anymore. Imagine how heartbreaking it is for the Shias during that time that they see Imam al-Askari going in front of them, but they have to treat him like a stranger. They can't say salam to him. This is how difficult it was. Some people, they ask, why did Imam al-Mahdi go into ghaybah? This is why. Because now, the, during the time of Imam al-Askari, the Shias can't even say salam to their Imam. So he says, لَا يُسَلِّمْ عَلَيَّ أَحَدٌ وَلَا يُشِيرْ عَلَيَّ بِيَدِهِ وَلَا يُومِ أَحَدُكُمْ فَإِنَّكُمْ لَا تَأْمَنُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسَكُمْ He says, don't even point at me. Don't even say, oh, this is Al-Hasan al-Askari. That's it. So, so in the year 254, Imam al-Hadi passed away and the Imamah officially came 
to Imam al-Hasan al-Askari. Now, Imam al-Askari, he carried out several tasks during his imama. The first, one of, one of the first things that happened was that al-Mu'taz al-Abbasi, he poisoned Imam al-Hadi. He asked the people, who's the next person after him? They tell him his son al-Askari. And from, if I'm not mistaken, Sayyid Muhammad was also poisoned. Sabah al-Dajjal, he was also poisoned. So, so um, Al-Mu'taz al-Abbasi, after he finds out that Imam al-Hasan al-Askari is the leader after his father, Imam al-Hadi, he sent to him a man by the name of Ibn Sa'id. He tells him, I want you to take him with you out in the desert and kill him and make it look like an accident. I want you to kill him and make it look like an accident. So the Imam is young at that time. The Imam is 22 years old. But the Khalifa can't stand the Imam. And then he tells him, I want you to come back to me and let me know that he's been killed. So some of those who were around the Khalifa, they found out of the plot of the Khalifa. So they wrote a letter to Imam al-Hasan al-Askari telling him that, be careful, this one, he's trying to kill you. He wants to kill you. Imam al-Hasan al-Askari, he replied to them with a letter that Allah is protecting me. For now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting me until I carry out my duties. And then that's the time that after I've carried out my duties, then it will be time for me to leave. Then the Imam, what was, what was a miracle and surprising for the Shias, or for the real Shias, it wasn't surprising, but it was a, a i'jaz from the Imam. He tells them, Al-Mu'taz, he's going to die within three days. He's not, going to, he's not going to make it for three days. At the end of three days, he's going to die. Because he killed one imam, Allah is not going to live, allow him to live to take the life of another imam. So within, within three days, there were Turkish officers in the palace. And as we mentioned, during the time of Al-Mutawakkil and Al-Mu'tasim, they brought the Turks. Al-Mu'tasim from his mother's side, they were Turks. His father had married a Turkish lady and they brought all the Turks from his mother's side. So they, they became so powerful in the palace and they would, they would rule the Khalifa. So the Khalifa in essence was very weak. He was very weak, but he would only show his strength on who? The on the Mazlumin and on the Imam. And this is the sign of a weak leader. They, they're weak. But they take out their, they show their weakness against someone else. So then came Al Muhtadi. Al Muhtadi, he came and he was a puppet Khalifa. He ruled for about one year, as we mentioned. And then after him came the last one, who was uh, Al Mu'tamid, who was the one who poisoned the Imam. So um, then during that time, during the time of Al Mu'tamid, Imam al-Hasan al-Askari alayhi salam was poisoned. He was poisoned, uh, excuse me, he was, not, he was poisoned during the time of al-Mu'tamid, but before that he was imprisoned for a brief while. He was taken into a dungeon in a prison and the Khalifa, he sends the harsh and rough guards. He tells them, I want you to go and torture the Imam, torture al-Hasan al-Askari. Two days later, he heard that those guards who were supposed to be torturing the Imam, he heard that they were praying with the Imam. In the, in the prison, they're sitting next to the Imam and they're praying. So he tells them, he calls for them. He tells them, I told you to go and harass him, to abuse him, to torture him. What happens? You're sitting and you're praying with him? They tell him, how can we harass him when all we see from him is salah and worship? That's all that we see from him. What, how could we harass him? So the Imam السلام, carried out several duties. Most importantly, the Imam, like all the Imams, their duty is to preserve Islam and the well-being of Muslims. So one of the things that he did during his time was that there was a scholar by the name of Abu Ishaq al-Kindi. Abu Ishaq al-Kindi, he sat and he wrote a book by the name of Tanaqadat al-Quran, the contradictions within the Quran. So... The student of the Imam, he came to the Imam and he tells him, There's, this guy is writing a book that's going to take so many people away from Islam. He's writing a book, Contradictions of the Qur'an. So the Imam al-Hasan al-Askari, he taught him how to refute the man with a very simple refute. He, he taught him how to refute. 
One of the examples that that man had in Tanaqadat al-Quran, and we explained this when we, when we talked about the Quran, Quranic sciences and the, the, the sessions on tafsir, is that some of the verses in the Quran, if you read them without context, without contextualizing, without understanding the time and the story that this verse was revealed, the, sto- the Quran has general verses, it has specific verses, without putting all of that into context, you're going to think that the Quran has contradictions. So this man, he took out verses out of context and he says, look at these contradictions. So one of them, he says, Allah says in the Quran, وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Say the haqq, the truth is from your Lord. Whoever wishes to believe, let them believe. And whoever wishes to not believe, let them not believe. In Surah Al-Kahf, yes. In another verse, he says, Allah says in the Quran, وَاللَّهُ خَلَقَكُمْ وَمَا تَعْمَلُونَ And your Lord created you and whatever you do. Meaning that everything is predestined. So this man, he comes and he says, what is this? In one verse, Allah says, فَمَنْ شَاءَ, uh, فمن شاء فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ And another one, God created you and everything that you believe in. So he says, this is a contradiction. And then he says the other one, the, the second example is regarding um, having multiple wives. He says, Allah says in one verse in the Quran, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَنْ لَا تُقْسِطُوا فِي الْيَتَامَى فَانْكِحُوا مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاء مَثْنَى وَثُلَاثُ وَرُبَاعُ He says, for some people this is their favorite verse. <laughs> he said, uh, No, not muta- the ayah of having more than one wife. No, the, for others it's yes, yes. Oh, you, you said for others. He says, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَنْ لَا تُقْسِطُوا فِي الْيَتَامَى If you cannot be just with the orphans, فَأَنْكِحُوا مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النساء. So marry what you can from the, from the woman, مَثْنَى وَثُلَاثُ وَرُبَى Two or three or four. فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَنْ لَا تَعْدِلُوا فَوَاحِدًا If you cannot be just and fair, then what? One. Then there's another verse in the Qur'an. This is the, this is the favorite verse of the ladies. What is it? Allah says in the Quran, وَلَن تَسْتَطِيعُوا أَن تَعْدِلُوا بَيْنَ النِّسَاءِ وَلَوْ حَرَصْتُمْ And you cannot be just with the woman even if you tried. So here he comes and he says, this is tanaqut. In one verse it says, if you can, and then the other verse says, you can't, you can't even if you tried. Of course, the scholars of tafsir, they've given interpretations for this. The, for, for the first one, the first example is Al-Haqqu Min Rabbikum is that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the, you, you are chosen, Allah has destined you in a way but you have the freedom to choose and you need to come and look at the context of the verse and the, what the Mufassirin have said but there's no contradiction in the Qur'an it's just that the Qur'an came at different levels regarding this one, regarding Adala is talking about talking about um, in expenses. In, expense, in one verse it's talking about expenses. If, if you can be fair in terms of expenses, then you could marry two or three or four. And the other verse is talking about love and mawadda, and you can't be fair when it comes to mawadda. But the verse that's regulating whether it, it becomes halal or haram, or you could marry more or, or not, is whether you are fair when it comes to expenses. It's not love, because you can't be fair with your love. Of course, the younger one, the, the one who's newer is going to probably have more attention. But the, the expenses, they have to be fair. So scholars, that, a, lot of, a lot of people, they come and they say, you know, no, you, you can't be fair. But as long, the scholars, they say, as long as you're fair when it comes to expenses, then it becomes okay for you. Of course, this is no way that I'm encouraging this, I'm just coming and setting out the law. So Imam al-Askari tells him, go and tell this person, he's writing a whole book, he's wasting all his energy writing contradictions of the Qur'an. Go and tell him this, هَلْ مِنَ الْمُمْكِنَ أَنَّ الشَّخْصِ لَا يَفْهَمِ الْكَلَامِ He tells him, he tells his student, go and ask Ibn Ishaq al-Kindi, the one who's writing this book. He tells him, is it a possibility that a person understands Someone in another way, for example, you tell me something, is it possible that I understood something different from what you meant? Is that a possibility? Yes. Yes. Right now, many times this happened. I say something, 
You understand it in one way, you understand it in another way. It's, this is something that is common because language, it's, it could be understood in a different way. So the imam is trying to tell him that is it possible that you did not understand what Allah meant and that's why you see it as a contradiction but if you actually understood what God meant in the Quran you won't see it as a contradiction. You would see that it falls in line, right? The student, he went to Abu Ishaq al-Kindi and he tells him this. He tells him, Man hadha? Who taught you this argument? He took that whole book that he wrote and he threw it in the fire. He says, my whole project I've been working on, I'm trying to come and see contradictions within the Quran. But he just came and said, okay, maybe I didn't understand it correctly. So it's not going to be a contradiction anymore, right? So this is one story. Another story is that during the time of Al-Mu'tamid Al-Abbasi, there was a drought. It wasn't raining. You've heard the story, right? There was a drought and Imam Al-Askari was imprisoned at that time. So people are going out and they're doing dua, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, let it rain. A Christian man, he comes in front of everyone and he's carrying something in his hand. They don't know. He does a dua and it begins to rain right away. So now the Khalifa, He's embarrassed as well because the Khalifa is Muslim and this Christian man, his dua is being accepted. People are going to go towards the Christian person. So he goes to Imam al-Askari who's in prison. He comes and he tells him, come and save the religion of your grandfather. Now they remember he's, his grandfather is Rasulullah. So Imam al-Askari, he comes out. He says, go and see what's in his hand. They go and they see there's a bone a bone from one of the prophets. One of the prophets, a bone from their body. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the sake of the prophet accepts the dua. We believe in that there's shafa'a for the sake of the prophet. Allah will accept the, the dua. So it began, to, it began to rain because he's holding a bone in his hand. He tells him take away the bone from him. And I'll ask him. His dua is not answered anymore. Then Imam al-Askari, he does dua himself and it begins to rain. So... This was one of the ways where he brought people back to the religion where that person was going to take them away from the religion. The Imam alayhi salam, he spread knowledge through his tafsir. Of course, his tafsir, some scholars today, they, not that we question the, taf, the, the tafsir of Imam al-Askari. If we know for sure that this is from Imam al-Askari, we would accept it right away. The problem with that narrative tafsir, the tafsir al-Rawai, is that we are not 100% sure that this goes back to the Imam. So because we question the authenticity, then it kind of, you know, takes away the, it, it takes away the power and it becomes harder to accept it. But some scholars, they do accept it. They, they follow another method of maslak al-qara'in, looking for clues here and there to see that, no, this makes sense. This doesn't contradict other hadith. This doesn't contradict the Qur'an. Then we will accept it. Anything you wanted to add? Uh, what if there are no other hadith but the Qur'an itself could be read that way and it's in tafsir That's a possibility, yes. That's a possibility. No other mufassir has, has given As long as it doesn't contradict the Qur'an. And not any contradiction, as long as it's not a straight out contradiction. Because sometimes the hadith, it does takhsis of the Qur'an. The Qur'an gives a general ruling, this comes and gives a, gives a specific ruling. It doesn't mean it's a contradiction. I tell you, you know, akram al-alim, honor the alim. And then another, another khas, another more specific order comes, Akram al-alim al-mu'min. Not any alim. You have to come and give honor the alim that's a mu'min. So now you know who to honor and who not to honor. So that doesn't mean that this hadith is contradicting the other hadith. We learned this in the mantaq, in logic and, and going into usul al-fiqh. We, we learn this to understand where the, the levels of the hadith. One, the Quran is laying out a general rule. But the hadith comes and it makes it more specific. It doesn't mean it's contradicting. It could make it more specific. Al-hadith yukhassas. So that's a, that's a very important point. One of the duties of the Imam alayhi salam was to preserve the Muslims as we mentioned. And another duty is to preserve the Shia. This is why we have the hadith of alamat al-mu'min. The signs of the mu'min which in a few days arba'een. You're going to hear this all the time. Alamat al-mu'min khamsa. There are five signs of the mu'min. Salat ihda wa khamsin, praying 51 rak'ahs in a 24 hour period. You have the 17 obligatory, 
the subah, dhuhr, asr, maghrib, asha, and you have 34 rak'ahs of the nawafil. You have eight and eight for the dhuhr and asr. You have the um, 11 rak'ahs, and then the fajr has, and the maghrib and asha have. You add them up, they're 34. Plus the 17, that's salat, ihda wa khimsin. That's one of the signs of the Shia. Alamat al Mu'min. Mu'min means Shia. So, wa ziyarat al Arba'in. Here there's a dispute among scholars. Some they say ziyarat al Arba'in, go and visit 40 Mu'mineen. Others they say, no, ziyarat al Arba'in means the ziyarah of Imam al Hussein. Uh, today, some scholars, they, they, it's an issue of dispute, but the majority they come and they say ziyarat al Arba'in of Imam al Hussein. Wa takhattum bil yameen. The Prophet used to wear the ring in his right They're until the time of Uthman. Until the time of Uthman, he came and he told them, wear it in your left. And it became, after the tahkim, when Amr ibn al-As, when, 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 when Amr ibn al-As, excuse me, not Uthman, I'm sorry, that was the basmala. The, the, the other sign that we're going to say, Jahr bi bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, that was Uthman. I'm, I'm sorry, I went ahead. The, the takhattum bil yameen, wearing the ring in the right, this was worn by Rasulullah all the way until Amir al-Mu'mineen. The Muslims, they would wear it. Then, after the issue of the arbitration, remember, after Safin, uh, Amr ibn al-As, what did he do? Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, he says, I take off the Khilafah of Ali ibn Abi Talib the same way I take off this ring. Amr ibn al-As, he came and he said, I place the Khilafah, I instate the Khilafah of Muawiyah the same way I put on this ring, and he put it in his left. I don't want to put it in my left because it might not come out. So, so this became the shu'ar of the enemies of the Ahl Bayt, wearing the ring in the left hand. Then Bani Umayyah, they kept encouraging, encouraging people to wear the ring in the left hand. The Imams, it became a sign of the Shia. Otherwise, it was a sign for all Muslims, wearing the ring in the right. But then it became, on the time of Imam al-Askari, he says that one of the signs of the Shia is التختم بالyameen. وتعفر الجبين وتعفير الجبين Placing your forehead on what? What do we do sujood on? We do sujood on the soil, on the turba. It's a sign of humility. مِنْهَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ وَفِيهَا نُعِيدُكُمْ وَمِنْهَا نُخْرِجُكُمْ تَارَةً أُخْرَىٰ Allah says we created you from this and to it we will return you and from it we will resurrect you. We do, do, we do sujood to that. Not on a Persian carpet or on, sujood on the, on the soil, yes. So ta'fir al-jabin is placing your head on the soil and this is why we carry the turba with us and we do sujood on the turba. وَالْجَهْرِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ This is the fifth sign. Al-Jahr bi Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the prayers. When, whenever today, right now, you go and you see in Masjid al-Haram and the, you know, these Salafis when they pray, what do they do? They don't say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and then suddenly Alhamdulillah. Suddenly they start. Where's Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? It's a part of the Quran. They don't mention it. It became because they stopped doing it. The Imam says, No, we have to keep this. This is something that we have to keep. Al-Jahr bi Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is why scholars say even when you were praying the Dhuhr and Asr prayers, the silent prayers, you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and then Alhamdulillah ya Rabbil Alameen. And then you begin to, but Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Jahr. Anytime you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, you say it out loud, Jahr. So any questions regarding this? Okay. The Imam alayhi salam, this was a hadith, he gives the signs of the Shia. Another, yes, Brother Ali. Uh, for, for the... Uh... Bismillah uh, al-Jahr. You said something uh, happened with Uthman. Yes, uh, I, that's, uh, thank you for bringing me back to that. Rasulullah said it, Jahr bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Abu Bakr, Umar, during the time of Uthman, he took it out. He took Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim out of the surahs. Out, out of the surahs? Yes, some surahs, they, today there, it's an issue of dispute. Al-Fatiha. It's all of them, they say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is a part of Al-Fatiha. But they don't say it out loud. He stopped saying it out loud. But the other surahs, some say it's not even a part of the surah. But we believe that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is a part of every surah. Some they would say, Rasulullah would just say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim as a gesture of we're beginning another surah. So it's like a, a divider between this surah and that surah. 
Because they wouldn't say like, Sadaqallah al You know, they would just, the Quran is being recited, and then Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, kaf ha ya ayn sad. So suddenly, how do they know that another surah has begun? Through the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. But some they say, oh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Rasulullah was not saying it as, this is a part of the surah. Rasulullah was just saying it as a divider between the surahs. But we understand it that it's a part of the surah. And this is why it's mushkil, it's, it's problematic if someone recites salah without Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is why we have to say the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in our prayers. Um, yes. Ask you a question. Yes. Uh, what would the exact niya be if we're praying um, behind a brother who's... who's Mutaba'ah. You do mutaba'ah, that means I'm not praying jama'ah because there are several things they do in their prayer that invalidate it. They don't, first of all, the imam is not adil. They do certain things that invalidate it. But for the sake of unity, and this is, we have hadith from the imams regarding this. But of course, these hadith, today some, this is a dispute amongst Muslims today, amongst Shia today. Like the, the hadith of Imam Sadiq, he says, Man salla khalfahum. Whoever prays behind them, this, it's as if this person has prayed behind Rasulullah Today, some they say, okay, go and pray behind them. You don't even need to, you don't even, you, you pray jama'a. You pray jama'a behind them. Other scholars, they say, no, the imam is in a position of taqiyya right now. If you're in taqiyya, you have to, because we have other hadith that come and say, that say the Imam has shurut, there's conditions. For the Imam, he has to be adil, he has to have such and such. Yes. So what, you, did I answer your question or you had something else yeah, you wanted, I wanted to say? I wanted to know what the niyyah was. Niyyah is mutaba'ah. We do mutaba'ah, but we follow along. You follow along. When I go to Mecca, Medina, you know, I follow along everywhere. And then if he's re reciting a longer surah or something, you just do tasbih, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. You know, you do a tasbih. And that's, it's, it's not talk, it's... Because you have to recite your own surah, you have to... You have to, yes, but then after you just do tasbih and then you do the ruku' and sujood and everything with them. And one final question. Yes, uh, go ahead. Is, is this consensus between all of the maraja or is this uh, disputed on? Them? Which issue? On, on praying behind them with the niya of mutaba. No. So from what I believe Sayyid Khamenei, um, I believe per perhaps Sayyid Fadlallah, they say you do jama'a. From, from, if I'm not mistaken, yes. They say, go and do the niyyah of jama'ah with them. Yes, because they, they use that hadith, man salla khalfahum kanaka man salla khalfa rasulillah. Basically, this is a green light from the imam. Go and pray behind them, jama'ah. And say, what's he saying? He says, mutaba'ah. Yes. Yes, brother, you had a question? I was going to comment that, going back to Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, that the printing the, the Qur'an, usually, like, I'm saying all the time, it has one after... Only Al-Fatiha. Yeah, so... Only Al-Fatiha, you see that it's a part of the... See, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, there's one after it. But Al-Baqarah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alif, Lam, Mim, and then there's one after it. They don't consider Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is even a disputed issue amongst some of the our scholars as well. But we say, if you don't say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in prayer, it might be problematic. So say it. So even if you don't, like you're... You're not certain that it's a part of the prayer, but in prayer you make sure you say it because it might be naqas. So then if, if it's a Shia printed Quran, like obviously all of them are from either Syria or Saudi yes. or Egypt, um, but would a hypothetically Shia printed Quran have ayah number one after each and every single Bismillah? I'm not sure. Maybe if we find one Quran like that. I don't think, so. I don't think it would, but... Um, in prayer, scholars say you have to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim for every surah. You recite Qul huwa Allahu ahad, you have to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Or you can't just say Wala al-Dhalin, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. You have to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So even if you believe or you're, you, have, you don't have enough proof to say that this is a part of the surah, if you don't say it, your salah is batil. This is what all scholars There's say. There's no problem if, let's say, Baqarah through Nas don't have ayah number one written after. No, this is just in the written. The Quran was oral transmission. Later on, it was written like that. It wasn't even like later on. It was it was printed in the way that it is today. Yes. So the Imam alayhi salam. I'm going to go a little bit quicker because there's a lot to cover. The Imam um, pr protected the Shia. He preserved the Shia. 
and even he showed compassion to the Shias, even to the, some of those who were sinners from amongst the Shia. When I say Shia, I mean Iman. The person is mu'min in the Imam. There's Iman and there's actions. It makes you a fasiq or not a fasiq. Maybe someone who's a Shia, but he goes and he does something haram. He, in his belief, he's Shia, but he's fasiq, meaning he does something wrong. So in Qom, there was a community of Shias and they had a marja, they had a scholar who was one of the companions of Imam al-Hassan al-Askari by the name of Ahmed ibn Isa. Ahmed ibn Isa was a known leader of the Qummis in, in Qom. So they say that a Shi'i man who was a sinner, he used to do certain things, he had certain habits that were not really good. He used to, he would go to Ahmed ibn Isa and he asked him for help. He asked him for financial assistance. Ahmed ibn Isa, he tells him, go away. You're a sinner, you're a fasiq. Even though he's a Shi'i, he tells him, you're a fasiq, I'm not going to help you. That's it. Ahmed ibn Isa, he goes to Hajj. He goes to Mecca, Medina. On his way back to Qom, he goes to visit his Imam. He goes to Samarra, he stands at the door of Imam al-Askari. He asks the Hajib, the person at the door. He tells him, can I see the Imam? He goes and he asks for permission. He comes back, he tells him the Imam did not give you permission to enter. This is a marja. Imagine one of the scholars who's the representative of the Imam, he's the one who carries out the duties, tells him the Imam did not give you permission. He stands at the door, he's sh shocked. He tells him, wait by the door. When he goes out to pray, you see him. He waits by the door, he sees the Imam on his way out. He tells him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, Assalamu alaikum, why did you, you know, you didn't let me enter, you didn't welcome me. He tells him, when one of our Shi'as comes to you and asks for help, why did you not help him? Why did you not help him? Of course, no one has told the Imam this. The Imam knows this because Allah has given him this knowledge. He says, when one of our Shi'as, don't you know that they are our orphans? Where do they go to? Our Shi'as are, are our orphans. If, they, if we do not help one another, then who's going to help them? They will go to the enemies, they will go to those who are who are, you know, again, who will turn them against the Shia. So Ahmed ibn Isa, he apologizes, he goes back to Qom immediately, he goes and he visits that man, he treats him so well, that man was shocked. They say that that man used to drink, so it wasn't something that was, a, it was a major issue. So any one of us, you know, we see someone who's drinking would probably not, but the Imam alayhi salam, he tells him, go to him and see if he needs financial assistance, you give him. He goes and he gives him. That man tells him, why are you changing your mood all of the sudden? He tells him, your Imam, your Imam Al-Hasan Al-Askari, he told me about you. That man began to cry and he said, Wallah, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to let go of the habits and I'm going to change my life. So imam, the Imams, we have many stories that the Imams, they see what's going on in the Shias. And Imam Al-Mahdi as well, he sees us right now. We should not break his heart with our bad habits and bad actions. The third point, and we will conclude with this, is that he prepared the believers and the Shia for the occultation. We will talk about the birth of Imam al-Mahdi on its own, inshallah, in the next session, because that has more to cover. But one of them is that he, would, he told people that he's going to have a son who's going to be the savior. Because today this is a major issue. Some people, they say, Hassan al-Askari, he had a son, or he didn't have a son. Today, one of the, all Muslims believe that Al-Mahdi is going to come at the end of the time. The issue, one of the issues of dispute is was he born or was he not born, right? Today, some, they say, he could be any bad person. يُصْلِحُهُ Allah fi layla. Even there's a, there's a speaker, a known Sunni speaker, he says that Al-Mahdi could, could be a bad person. He could be someone who's a criminal, like a, Gangster, someone who's not even really, not even really that good of a person. يُصْلِحُهُ Allah فِي لَيْلَ Allah will change him in one night. He will become a good person and suddenly he will establish justice. So we believe that. No. Imam al-Mahdi was born. يُصْلِحُ Allah أَمْرَهُ فِي لَيْلَ His circumstances are going to change within one night where he's going to be able to establish justice on earth. So today, some, they don't believe that Imam al-Mahdi was born. But Imam al-Hasan al-Askari, he made sure to let everyone know from his Shias that Imam al-Mahdi was born or he's going to be born. 
One of, his, one of the narrators, Isa ibn Sabih, he says they brought Imam al-Hasan al-Askari into the prison with me. I was in the prison, they brought him. So he says the Imam asked me, do you have a son? I tell him, no, I don't have a son. Please do dua for me that Allah grants me a son. He says the Imam did dua for me. And then I, he says, I asked the Imam, do you have a son? So the Imam, seems that the Imam wanted that man to ask him, do you have a son? The Imam tells him, no, I don't have a son right now, but I will have a son who will establish justice on earth after it has been filled with oppression. So he tells this to Isa ibn Sabih. And he, he, helped, he, helped, um, he helped prepare the Mu'mineen and the Shia for the deputies. Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri, he was the representative of al-Askari before. So that's why after the death of al-Askari, when people go to Uthman ibn Sa'id, he is connected with Imam al-Mahdi. So he gave him that pos position of authority so that it wouldn't be a difficult transition for the Shi'as. They go to Imam al-Mahdi who has left. He's, he's gone, you know, immediately after the death of his father. How are they going to find him? So Uthman ibn Sa'id was telling them, no, Imam al-Mahdi is giving me, he gave me this letter and he tells me do this, do that. And the issue of the age of Imam al-Mahdi was not an issue anymore because Imam al-Jawad and Imam al-Hadi, they were all Imams when they were young. And we have this famous hadith that is used today for taqlid and for following a mujtahid. This is a hadith from Imam al-Hasan al-Askari. Today they ask you, why do you follow a marja'? You tell them because of this hadith. فَأَمَّا Imam al-Askari, he says, فَأَمَّا مَنْ كَانَ مِنَ الْفُقَهَاءِ the one who's a faqih, sa'inan li nafsih, protects themselves, hafidan li deenih, protects their faith, mukhalifan li hawah, goes against their own desires, mukhalifan li hawah, muti'an li amri mawlah, he follows the orders of his mawla, meaning each marja, our maraja, they have a mawla today. Each marja, no matter how great they are, no matter how long their beard is, they have an imam. Today, some of us, we forget that they have an imam. When we start, you know, looking at the, them as the position of the imam. No, at the end of the day, they're representatives of the imam. So he says, فَلِلْعَوَامْ أَنْ يُقَلِّدُوهُ What happens? The am, the awam, the layman, they follow this person. يُقَلِّدُوهُ تَقْلِيد يُقَلِّدُوهُ وَذَٰلِكَ لَا يَكُنْ إِلَّا بَعْضْ فُقَهَاءِ الشِّعَ لَا كُلُّهُمْ And then he tells him, and this is only some of the fuqaha of the Shia, not all of them. The Shia have many fuqaha. Faqih means someone who knows the laws, the fiqh. So he says not all of them. So it means, this is why some they use this hadith, they say that you have to follow the a'lam. You can't just follow anyone who's a faqih. You have to follow the one who's the most learned. And another and another uh, way where the Imam was connected with the people is he writes a letter to Ali ibn Babaway al-Qummi. Who's Ali ibn Babaway al-Qummi? The father of the father of Shaykh al-Saduq. He's buried in Qum. I remember I used to we used to have a class right by his grave. He has a sh small shrine in a small masjid. Um, he's buried there. Shaykh al-Saduq is buried in Tehran, in South Tehran, Ray. Ali ibn Babaway is buried in Qom. Of course, Shaykh al-Saduq was born, according to some, was born by the dua of Imam al-Mahdi. Ali ibn Babaway was connected with Imam al-Askari. Imam al-Askari, he writes him a letter. كتب الإمام رسائل عديدة إلى أصحابه يعظم فيها يعظمهم فيها ومنها هذه الرسالة التي بعثها إلى علي ibn al-Husayn ibn Babaway al-Qummi. He sends him this letter. He tells him, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Wal-Aqibatu lil-Muttaqeen, Wal-Jannah lil-Muwahideen. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all praises due to Allah. Wal-Aqibat, the ending, is for the Muttaqeen, the pious. Wal-Jannah lil-Muwahideen, and heaven is for those who, Muwahideen, they believe in one God. Wala udwana illa ala al-Zalimeen, and no aggression except upon the oppressors. وَلَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ أَحْسَنَ الْخَالِقِينَ There is no God other than Allah, the best of creators. وَالصَّلَاةُ عَلَىٰ خَيْرِ خَلْقِهِ مُحَمَّدٍ وَعِتْرَتِهِ الطَّاهِرِينَ And prayer upon the best of creation, Muhammad and his holy household. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. 
عليك بالصبر he tells him now you have to be patient عليك بالصبر وانتظار الفرج and you have to wait for the faraj فإن النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم قال the prophet says أفضل أعمال أمتي انتظار الفرج the best of the deeds of my ummah is what انتظار الفرج so this is a hadith from Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وآله إمام العسكري now he's getting Ali ibn Babawi ready because he died during the life of Ali ibn Babawi and then he says ولا تزال شيعتنا في حزن حتى يظهر ولدي الذي بشر به النبي صلى الله عليه وآله our Shia are going to remain in sadness until my son will emerge the one who my grandfather Rasulullah who Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وآله told us about يملأ الأرض قسطا وعدلا كما ملئ الظلما وجورا my son المهدي he will establish justice on earth just as it has been كما ملئ الظلما وجورا see the Imam says the Imam says ولا تزال شيعتنا في حزن our Shias are going to remain sad meaning that we're not going to achieve real victory except through the Imam and this is something that we have to tell ourselves that there is no real victory except through the Imam there's no real Eid except through the Imam if we put that in our mind then we will become desperate to call for the Imam and then maybe the Imam will come faster but today we're living our lives and we've we're comfortable here and there. We're not desperate for the Imam. And Allah says in the Quran, Amman yujibul muftar. You have to be muftar. Then Allah will answer you. So he says, Wala tazal shi'atuna fi huzn hatta yadhar waladi alladhi bashara bihi nabi yamla ul arda qistan wa adla kama muli al dhulman wa jawra. Fasbir ya shaykhi ya abal hassan. Be patient, O shaykh, O abal hassan. فإن الأرض لله يورثها من يشاء من عباده والعاقبة للمتقين. The earth belongs to God, and Allah will eventually make the ibad inherit the earth. والسلام عليك وعلى جميع شيعتنا. And peace be upon you, and peace be upon all of our Shia. ورحمة الله وبركاته. وصلى الله على محمد وآله. So here, the Imam عليه السلام he does a dua for the father of Shaykh al-Saduq, Ali ibn Babaway al-Qummi. And of course, al-Mu'tamad al-Abbasi, he poisoned Imam al-Hasan al-Askari in the year 260 after Hijrah. He passed away and he was buried in his house in Samarra next to his father, Imam al-Hadi. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa ala alihi al-Tahirin. Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala muhammad. Allahumma salli.